Father's Day today? Oh, yeah. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, God. All right. Today's passage we'll be looking at is out of Luke 15. And maybe now you can hear me a little better. Luke 15 is the common, the well-known story of the prodigal son. But today's focus, I want to focus on the father in the story. It's sometimes an overlooked person in this passage, but I think a very important person because he does represent God in this parable. But before we get into that, I do want to bring up some interesting things. Today's Father's Day message, we want to talk about the incredible role that fathers play. Fathers have an important role in a child's life, whether you're a boy or a girl. Um, you had a father. You may not have known your father, uh, but your father is your father, just like your mother. Everybody's got a mother. I want to take time to appreciate the very important role that parents, but especially fathers, play. They can make impressions that last a lifetime, but unlike Mother's Day, which was founded in 1914, Father's Day didn't get national recognition until 1966. That's over 52 years later. Kind of an afterthought. Similarly, sometimes Father, Father's Day, Fathers, sometimes we are kind of an afterthought in some ways. But today I want to exemplify the importance. And um, so first I want to look at the absence of fathers and the effect that has on a generation. We have an enormous amount of children and an enormous amount of generations of kids growing up without fathers. And it doesn't mean that they have to go down a bad path, but what it means is somebody needs to step into the role and be a father to them. We need spiritual fathers. Perhaps there was somebody in your life that was a spiritual father to you. Maybe he wasn't your father father, but he was your spiritual father. We all need those. So today, again, we'll be looking at Luke 15. And in this chapter, Jesus gives the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. You see there's a common theme through this chapter. Today we'll be looking at this parable of the prodigal son and his father. Not only do fathers play an important role in child life, but they also play a key role in society and the church family. My purpose is not to beat up fathers for their failures, but to give you a motive and a perspective to do better. Fathers, we can do better. For the mothers, oh, I don't want you tuning out today, so listen up. For you mothers to raise boys and girls, but boys especially, that will be fathers of character. Fathers someday to another generation that will go beyond you. And for the ladies that may not be mothers, qualities to look for in men that you may be courting, or the men that may be courting you in prospect of marriage. Now, of course, we all fall short of God's standards, Amen. but I'm not perfect. My dad's not perfect. I'm kind of blessed in the respect that I got two dads. I've got an adopted dad and I've got a biological father. Yeah. The cool thing that my adopted dad could say that my biological father can't say is oops. <laughs> <laughs> he actually, my adopted father actually got to choose to give me his name. He got to choose. And in the same way, we have a God, godly father who chooses us in a similar fashion. Sometimes, though, like the prodigal son, we have a way of running off to foolishness. So, in order to see where we are going, we need to know where we're at. So, here's where we are. I'm going to give you a few statistics to show that. According to recent statistics, 40%, oh, that's almost 50% of American children do not have a dad at home. And again, I'm not saying this to beat you up, but I want you to know where we're at so we know where we need to go. Amen. So there are many reasons for fatherless homes. It may be that the father's home, but he's working all the time. He may be a workaholic. It may be that the father is passed on. It may be that the father is divorced or, or whatever it may be. For whatever reason, there's a variety of reasons but the bottom line is that fatherlessness increases a variety of societal problems. And they include 
higher incarceration rates, higher suicide rates, behavioral disorders, increased high school dropouts, lower education attainment, higher juvenile detention rates, which I see on a day-to-day -day basis, identity confusion. That's a hot topic in, in the news today, talking about marriage. There's also increased aggression, lower academic, academic achievements, and increased criminal activity. So suicides. Suicides are actually increased in a fatherless home. 63% of youth suicides come from a fatherless home. Those are unnecessary deaths. Kids that needed a father in their home. Behavioral disorders. Adam, the stats are showing that 85% of all children who exhibit behavioral disorders come from a fatherless home. 71% of all high school dropouts, that's 71% of them come from fatherless homes. That's not by accident. You'd almost think there was a design causing this. What about lower educational expectations? If you don't have both parents in the home, there's less parents to help with homework, tutoring, all of that is, is taken away. Less parental monitoring of schoolwork, and less overall social supervision. Incarcerated. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. Perhaps their fathers are incarcerated. Perhaps they're gone for whatever reason, failed relationships, or maybe they're dead. Aggression. There have been shown greater levels of aggression in boys from mother-only households than from boys in mother-father households. I remember as a child, mom, you remember, when my father wasn't around, because we did come from a divorced home, and she was going through a single mother era, I acted out, and I acted out a lot. I picked on my brothers, and I think I even got in fights with my mom, um, so things I don't want to remember, but that's the truth. When there's not a father figure there to rein in the kids, you're going to have all kinds of problems. And mom, I'm sorry for that. Sorry for all that I uh, put you through. <laughs> so there's a couple other things. Lower performance that we talked about in criminal activity. The likelihood that a young male will engage in criminal activity, it doesn't just increase, it doubles if he is raised without a father. And it triples three times more likely to be involved in criminal activity if he lives in a neighborhood with a high concentration of single parent families. So it's not just a family issue, it's a societal issue. We have some things to work on. In order to, need to know where we're going, we need to know where we're at. You can start from somewhere, this is where we're starting, unfortunately. So, where do we go from here? So due to the severe need of father figures in the world, we especially need men in the church to step up and to step out and to be spiritual fathers to others. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4.15, for though you may have 10,000 teachers in Christ, you do not have many fathers. And he's talking about spiritual fathers. You know, I only, we really only have one natural father, don't we? And he might have been using that as an analogy. We only have one father in reality, in, in our natural order of things. But spiritually, we need fathers too. We need somebody to be What's the difference between a father and a teacher? Just think about that for a second. A teacher tells you what to do, what's right, teaches you, you know, it could be any number of things, history, uh, how an engine works. Um, but a father is invested to see that you do well, okay? And he's gonna take an investment in you doing well. So today we're gonna see from the prodigal son how a faithful father can lead his children to success by incorporating five key habits in fathering. The problems are real and increasing. Whether you like it or not, there's a huge effect of fathers in a child's development. So you can look at this as admonishment. Maybe you've messed up, maybe you fouled up. Or you can look at this as an opportunity to do better. An opportunity to see what God's word says to bridge that gap. 
And I hope and pray that this message goes out beyond the walls of this church because we need to hear this message. God's word has been sidelined by our communities for far too long in our country. I heard on the news this week already, what is wrong with our country? Some of the things that are going on, you know. It's not a country issue. It's a spiritual issue. And there's a spiritual root in this. We need God. Amen. With the recent gun violence, people are asking what's wrong with our country. With gang violence, think about this. Gang violence is an appealing choice for teens who don't have a family. It provides security, protection, an opportunity to be included in something greater than themselves. Fathers, are we allowing that to happen because we are stepping out of our role? We need to step back in. There's some other things going on, too, in our society, but society starts with the family. Amen. We have economic disparity, poverty, Amen. making people financially desperate to do things they wouldn't normally do. Yeah. Abortion rates are higher than ever. Consider that we may be under some kind of judgment from God because of our failed fathering. We need to step in and step up and encourage those around us encourage other fathers to not give up when things don't go right we need encouragement I need encouragement my ego gets busted real easily I need somebody when they see me down to say hey you can do it let's, let's try it again maybe it didn't work this time but let's keep going okay we can do this together yeah. fathers take this opportunity to do a little self-examination but also I hope that you are encouraged to do more to realize that you are truly needed in this world yeah. fathers you are as someone has said before, a powder keg of possibilities. With that powder keg, imagine a powder keg full of dynamite, okay? There's an explosive amount of energy in a man. And with that comes responsibility. With that powder comes a strong warning because men can be very dangerous too. If that powder keg explodes from a moral failure, whether that be adultery, theft, any criminal activity, um, you know, emotional blow-ups. A whole community can be devastated by the effects. That explosive power that God designed us with, we are to use it as God designed for. And that is to be influencers for good. So, let's get back to the prodigal son. We're going to see how a godly father can lead his children to success, even if our children are disobedient. There's five key habits we'll be looking at in following. So, let's read from the text if you read with me, from Luke 15, we'll be starting in verse 11. It says, actually, let me pray. We need to pray. Amen. Men, we need to be prayer warriors. Amen. And we need to hear from God. We could be reading his word and it just in one ear, out the other. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word, which is true. It sanctifies, it purifies, and it gives us the direction we should go. Let this word from you speak to our hearts speak to our minds convict us to have an influential impact in our society but also in our families and also within ourselves individually maybe we didn't have the greatest father or example in the world but Lord help us to be a spiritual father to those around us and to encourage fathers as we see them throughout our lives whether it be at work whether it be at school whether it be wherever it may be. And Lord, I hope, I hope and pray these kids that are here today that they would hear this message as well and learn that, yeah, no father is perfect, but Lord, we can grow into being better than before. That we can grow up to be fathers and to be a generation that's better than the prior. In Jesus' name, Lord, help us to hear and open our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name I pray. So, Right into the text. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to him. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country and he had nothing. Verse 15. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who had sent him into his fields to feed pigs, which isn't a very good job if you're Jewish. Verse 16, he longed to eat his fill from the carob pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. When he came to his senses, he said, 
How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger? I'll go get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his slaves, Quick, bring out the best robes, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. Let's celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Amen. Now his older son was in the field and he heard music and dancing. He summoned one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back and safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him but he replied to his father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May God add his blessing to the hearing and reading of his word. Yes. So the first point we're going to look at today, a father can lead his children to success by providing for their needs. Now in this instance, he was the son was requesting an inheritance ahead of time. The younger said to him, his father, Father, give me a share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Usually you wouldn't get your inheritance till after a father dies. So, this is the equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead. Ooh, kind of a knife to the heart. So he gave up his rights as son, and he looked to the city lights, and the son decided to set out on his own foolish living. But notice something in this passage. The father didn't argue, he didn't offer advice, and he didn't withhold blessing from him. He provided and sometimes as fathers, I think we get, I don't know if it's a bad rap or what, and a lot of single fathers get the bad rap of being a deadbeat, but a lot of fathers, single fathers out there, work very hard, whether it's to pay child support, to provide for their kids, and they need to be honored and, and respected in that, not to be called a deadbeat dad. Amen. So we need to be careful how we use that terminology. Maybe there is a deadbeat dad out there, you know? Let's use scripture to build him up. But... Um, it was probably not easy for this father in the prodigal parable to provide, but he did. When the father provides in faith, a father can see God's providence to his family, even in complete poverty, by being faithful and righteous to God. So, Psalm, in reference to that as well, I want you to look at Psalm 37, 25. Maybe you write this down on your notes on the back of your program. Psalm 37, 25 says, I have not seen the righteous abandoned nor his children begging for bread. Well, there's a promise you can think about. When the cupboards are empty, sometimes we need to be relying on God Amen. rather than the food pantry or whatever it may be. God will provide through those ways. But yeah. what does he say here? He says, I, say, I have not seen the righteous abandoned nor his children begging for bread. So fathers, we need you to be living righteously. Don't allow sin to affect your children in a negative way. The command is to provide. The command to provide also goes hand in hand with the Sabbath command, the Sabbath law. It wasn't just a command to rest, but it was also a command to work. We are to work six days and rest one day. But some of us have it backwards. None of us, but some people do. Right? It is hard to provide without working, though, isn't it? Uh, we think that work has to have pay attached to it, but that isn't always true. When I'm working in my garden, I don't get a paycheck for that, but I will see the fruit of my labor in due time. Yeah. Sometimes our work doesn't pay immediately. But with God, be wise in the work that you do. 
God values hard work, and he will bless the work of your hands if you commit your way to him. The Bible also says in 1 Timothy 5.8, If anyone does not provide for his own relatives, and especially his household, he has denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. So, first he provides for the material needs. He also provides an inheritance. And thirdly, he also provides security and safety. There was a story um, that I want to share with you. We are to be a provider, and I want to say this too, it's not dependent on our circumstances. It's not dependent on anything, on our ability or disability. It's an assumed responsibility. The father was the provider, the protector, and the security for his family. A family was a lot more vulnerable back then as well, um, whether it be weather, or robbers or violence um, when a, with a strong man to lead though a family could grow and increase in the land see a father establishes a safe and secure environment so the family can excel but also in society without fathers we have some serious societal effects that prove fathers are needed for children to do their best and to illustrate this there's a story I want to share with you there was a special on TV. How many of y'all like elephants? Any kids like elephants out there? I like elephants. They're pretty smart creatures. There was a special on a herd of young elephants that were running wild. They were running over trees, fighting each other, and creating havoc in their environment. They were male elephants gone wild. And experts were trying to figure out what was happening. Finally, they noticed that there were no adult, adult males in the herd. They were all teenage elephants that had lost their natural mind. The reason that there was no adult male elephants is the poachers had come in and killed them for their ivory. So in an attempt to fix the problem, the experts flew in a male adult, or actually a group of male adult elephants, and dropped them into the herd. So when these male elephants were dropped in the midst of the herd, in the midst of the chaos, they began flapping their ears, raising their trunks, and making these loud noises. A few days of flapping their ears, raising their trunks, and making these sounds, the teenage male elephants finally started calming down. As long as the teenage elephants were calling their own shots, you had a gang of elephants that had gone crazy because of lack of discipline. But when the adult male elephants were dropped in, they flapped their ears, they raised their trunks, and they made a loud noise, they demanded order. Elephants are pretty smart. But we've got some teen terrorists today because there are no male elephants in the midst. We need a generation of adult male elephants, real men, who will flap their ears, raise their trunks, and sound out the truth of what a man really is in order to calm down the generation who doesn't know how to act because they've never seen male elephants in their midst. In addition, a father can lead his children by leaving a memory that echoes years later. Yeah. So a father's voice echoes is our next point. In verses 17 through 19, when he came to his senses, he said, How many fathers, hired hands, have more than enough food? He came to his senses. So he's off doing his own thing, living foolishly, spending all his money, feeding the pigs, um, wishing he would eat the pig's food, wish, wishing he had what the pigs had, and all this time, finally, his senses returned to him. And he said, hey, I can go work for my dad. I'd be doing a lot better than I am right now. So a father's voice really does echo in the head of the child years later. I myself experienced this, and maybe you've experienced this. I remember in college, when I was doing a bunch of foolish living, don't say you haven't, <laughs> okay? My father's voice literally started echoing in my head. I started hearing some of the things that he would say as a young kid, when I was like eight or nine years old, like when I was trying to mow the lawn and I didn't get the rows exactly right. I missed a whole strip. He taught me a job worth doing at all is a job worth doing right. And he would add, doing it right the first time. <laughs> but that was my dad's voice and that was some of his wisdom that he poured into me. And your dad doesn't have to be smart, but he has to be involved. 
Okay? So, the son came to his senses thinking about his father's house. All the stories, all the teachings that the father has to give may be taken for granted while they're in the house, but they will come back to you in the time of greatest need. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. There's something to that. Train up. I think there's something to that. When you train up, you're disciplining them to do good, to not do bad. It's pretty simple. They do bad, they get a punishment. I'm not saying, you know, we need to be very careful not to abuse our kids. But sometimes, um, kids need discipline in different ways. My kids, I can't discipline them the same. Alex, a spanking would break his heart. And he would take it personally, emotionally. Um, Chloe, on the other hand, she could take a spanking and laugh. And <laughs> run around. If you know Chloe at all, that's her. A spanking doesn't do much. So you have to be careful and choose your discipline wisely. So, but I do want to bring this in too. Uh, some people think that if you're just throwing around the baseball with your son, then you're doing a good job. And I don't, I'm not saying that's bad, but you can't stop there. And you can't settle for that. But my father would go farther and say those little statements like that. He would uh, ask me out there to help him with the engine. He'd say, hey, bring me this 9 16 wrench. You know, and I'd be like, what's a wrench? <laughs> you know. But he was teaching me things, even though I didn't know he was teaching me things. It stuck with me. He taught me about engines. He helped me work on my Pinewood Derby car for scouts. Years later, while in college, I heard the words echoing back to me at an instrumental time, like I said, and it helped keep me on track. The same thing can happen in the church. Maybe you didn't have a father. Maybe, maybe your father was absent. We can be a spiritual father to those that are growing in their faith. Okay, As people are growing in their faith, we need to be dis dis disciplining them, teaching them, coming alongside them, helping them. So, the father's teaching echoed in his son's head. It echoes in their future. You may not realize it, you may not know how it's going to happen, but your teaching will also do that too. When you teach a new believer and you encourage people, it will echo. Don't give up on any kid, child, or prodigal. Keep loving them and teaching them the truth. And eventually, if God has his way, they will echo it in their mind at just the right time. A father must teach their child from their experiences. Must teach them Bible scriptures. Experiences teach from stories that are unique to the, that person. Nobody else has the experiences that you have. And those experiences are probably needed in that person's life. Dads don't have to be smart to invest in their children's success, but they do need to be involved, like I said. My father was a recovered AA member, Alcoholics Anonymous, if you don't know. And he would always give credit to God for his recovery. He would say that God helped him to make that change in his life. That experience shaped him, and it taught my brothers and I, from what he knew about drugs and alcohol to be destructive behavior, he taught that to us. It wasn't from reading self-help books. It wasn't from you know this or that. It was from his experience himself and how it destructed his life. He had firsthand experience, and that was needed to teach me. We have firsthand experience our failures, you know, our teaching experiences that we can teach others in the church, but also our families. We need to hear that so we don't make the same mistakes. We also need to hear from our fathers on the scriptures and how to wisely apply those. We need to teach wisdom. Those are taught by their fathers. These things, whoever teaches these things will do well in their life. Thirdly, a father can lead his children to success by exhibiting compassion. My next point is a father's compassion or love so he got up and went to his father but while the son was still a long way off his father saw him and was filled with compassion or love a father's love he ran through his arms around his neck and kissed him so the father did not hold he didn't hold on to the rebellious actions of his son against him he saw his son and had compassion on him he didn't walk towards him he ran he didn't give him a cold handshake and say, welcome back, son. No, he gave him a hug. He threw his arms around him and kissed him on his neck. Love heals. 
And sometimes as fathers, we get this kind of uh, man ego, whatever you want to call it, um, where we don't want to you know, show affection. We really need to get rid of that. It's really just uh, insecurity. Okay? We need to be men of courage that are willing to show love in those kinds of ways. Kids do better with that. We don't, I don't know if it's a, a fathers need to toughen up their kids or what it is, but we can toughen them up in love, with love, in the scriptures. The scriptures will give them the ammo they need to fight life's battles. We don't need our fathers to toughen us up necessarily. Okay. Let's see. First Peter 4 8 says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. And that's what love did in this prodigal story. He loved his son, he overlooked his son's transgressions. Typically, men are less affectionate than women. However, a father is never, a great father is never afraid to show love. In fact, boys need a loving, affectionate touch from their father and to develop healthier relationships when they have it. Does that make sense? They develop healthier relationships when they get that positive touch from their father. Girls also need to know a father's affectionate touch. Without father's love and attention, girls will go to greater lengths to get that attention elsewhere. And sometimes that attention seeking can go haywire. We need our healing hug of a father after a failure more than ever. So men, lavish your love on your kids as, as an example of the proper kind of affection that they are to give and to receive. And someone said once that he wants to encourage you, and I give you the same admonition, I want to encourage you strongly to admonish every father, both natural and spiritual, to begin to run after your sons and daughters as fast as as you can. There may be perhaps no greater dimension of God's love. Okay. And next, we see that a father can lead a children to success by forgiving wrongs. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So there was a repentance there. But the father told his slaves, quick, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put on his ring on his finger and sandal on his feet. A father's example of forgiveness shows how deep his love really is. If we have trouble forgiving, perhaps we're weak in our love. So, men, are you strong in your love? Without love, it's really hard to forgive. Someone once said, if we hold on to unforgiveness, it's like taking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. Unforgiveness leads to resentment and anger. The Bible says, fathers, don't stir up your uh, children to anger or to wrath, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So we need to teach our children forgiveness. So a father, a father's forgiveness is powerful. A father can help his prodigy or progeny by accepting them when they return without consequence, without repercussion. We don't harp on a mistreatment. We celebrate the resurrection, which leads us to the final point. A father can lead his children to success by recognizing and celebrating spiritual victories. So the father celebrated. He killed a fatted calf. They had ribs and steak that night. Because of this, my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and found, so they began to celebrate. We need to celebrate victories in our spiritual lives. The Bible says the angels of heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. So we too, how can we celebrate? Maybe we can have a party in here whenever somebody comes to Christ. Okay? Maybe we can have something like that going on to exemplify the fact that the angels in heaven are celebrating. This son came looking like a bum, dirty clothes and all, barefoot. When a sinner repents, he is turning from the road he was on, the road of rebellion and foolishness, and he turns back to be merely a slave in his father's house. The son, dirty and smelling of hogs, is clothed and covered, a ring put on symbolizing sonship, and the shoes are required. As far as we can tell, the sonship is not based on the worth of the son, 
but on the love of the Father. He was lost, but now is found. Dead, but now is alive. We too must recognize and celebrate each other's spiritual victories, else we become like the older brother, bitter and jealous. A child especially needs it. And fathers, I encourage you to be your child's number one encourager when it comes to spiritual victories. And to give us some practical applications, um, drawing from an article by a guy named, with the same initials as me, Billy Hornsby, he says in an article titled, A Time to Be Fathers, he says, there are seven titles to describe the role that a mentor plays in the life of his disciple. And this could also be the role of fathers. So here we go. Number one, a discipler. He communicates the basics of following Christ. Can you do that? Can you communicate the basics? This is for everybody. This isn't just for men. Can you communicate the basics of following Christ? You need to be able to do that. The discipler takes the disciple through the daily disciplines and helps them to become a successful and a true follower of Christ. How to pray, how to build strong relationships, how to offer and receive forgiveness, walk in the spirit, and other important steps that are taught in this caring mentor discipler relationship secondly spiritual guide a father should be a spiritual guide a spiritual guide provides accountability and insight for maturity a kid doesn't become mature by accident they are taught they they learn from experiences but they also need wisdom from somebody who's been there before and this doesn't have to be their father but the father is a good person for that a spiritual guide is to someone in spiritual matters to help them understand the spiritual implications of events in everyday life. The disciple must learn to be accountable to someone, and if a child is not accountable to their father or to someone spiritually, then they're going to be like those elephants. Elephants gone wild. The disciple must learn to be accountable to someone, and they can bring correction and instruction with mature and productive methods. Thirdly, the role a mentor plays in the life of a disciple is coach. Anybody been a coach for a sports team or you know a little league team or something? We need to be coaches spiritually, life coaches. We need to encourage each other in the things that we're going through. Some of us are going through some really hard things and no one else is reaching out to us. Some of us just need to reach over and, and get involved, okay? We, we are not meant to be separated. We are a church. We are supposed to be intimately knitted together, one body in Christ. A coach gives motivation and teaching skills for action. A coach shows his team members how to play the game to win with a victorious victorious outcome. So he knows the players and what they're good at, what they're not good at. He knows what they need to improve. He provides encouragement, recognition, while bringing them through the regiments of the game of life. So he needs to be a coach. Coach, encourage someone. Encourage your, your juniors, your children. Fourthly, they need to be a counselor. And maybe you're like, I don't know about that. The Bible says uh, we need to have godly counselors. We need godly wisdom poured into our life. We also need, let's go ahead and go on. We need, we need teachers. We need sponsors. Someone to sponsor us, so to speak. And we need role models. If we can be a role model to our children... They're going to follow us whether we think about it. If we say one thing and do another, what do you think the kids are going to follow? Amen. Your example, not what you say. What we do needs to be in line with what we're teaching and what our ideals are. We need to become a living example to be emulated in all phases of life. The young men need the older men. The young women need the older women. Okay, We are learning from one another. 90%, think about this, this is a... a very high number. 90% of what we learn comes from what has been demonstrated for us. So when it comes to spiritual truths, think about that. We can read the Bible, but until we see it played out in somebody's life, it doesn't really seep in deep. And, and we don't know how to live that out sometimes. But we need to live that out. Sometimes in faith, if we don't have that example, to be that example. Okay. All right. And I have more, but I think I gave you guys enough. 
So, as we've looked at the prodigal son and the faithful father, we've seen how a father can lead his children to success by providing for their needs, whether that's an inheritance or working to ensure that their needs are provided for, providing safety and security. A father also needs to leave a memory that echoes years later. A father has to be involved for that to happen. And by exhibiting compassion or love, a father needs to be man enough to show love to his family. And he also needs to be forgiving of wrongs. Now, everybody's going to have wrongs done against them. I, I constantly think it's hilarious that God would put two sinners together to be married for a lifetime. And we're supposed to get along. We're sinners together. It takes work. And it doesn't matter if you're a married couple or if you're working with other people. Working with other people, we have a sin nature. It's going to be challenging. People are going to wrong you. So you need to be able to learn how to handle that maturely. <coughs> and we also need fathers to recognize and celebrate spiritual triumphs. Without those celebrations, we're not getting that positive reinforcement to keep doing it, to keep going forward, to keep winning at the spiritual um, race in life. The, the So with the current state of fatherlessness in our society, as we've, you guys have heard some of the statistics, they're astounding. We need fathers. There are kids out there that are hurting, that are getting abused, that are just out there abandoned because nobody has stepped up. We need fathers. To the men of the church, we've seen how you can be a father figure to those in fatherless households and to the young ladies. I hope that this message encourages you in what you can look for in a future husband so that you can see the need for a mature man to be the father of your children. And to those who have lost a father, honor your father by making God your father and committing your walk to Christ. So as we close out, I just want to invite you, this is the time, if you have a decision to make for Christ, to come forward and let that be known. If you want us to pray with you, we'll pray with you. If you want us to, whatever that may be, if you want to make a decision for baptism, we can make that happen. So whatever your need is, don't keep it to yourself. Come forward. Um, let us minister to you. Let the church minister to you and be a part of this body of Christ. We have all kinds of ways you can be more involved than just today. We need the church to be strong for each other, but also for the lost out there. So, let's close with prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your word, which is true. Thank you for our fathers and our families, but also our spiritual fathers. Fathers that have poured into us, used scripture to encourage us, to, to admonish us. Fathers that will correct us when we need it. And spiritual fathers that step into society and, and get involved with young men, you know, be, being fathers to youth groups, whatever that may be. Lord, we thank you for them. We pray for more. Your word says the workers are few, but the, <laughs> the work, is, there's a lot of work to be done, but the laborers are few. Lord, we pray that you would raise up laborers to get to that field. Lord, we pray all this. Help us to be better fathers. Help us to go from here transformed by the renewing of our minds, by the word of God, by the Holy Spirit. Empower us to step each step in boldness of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. So we're going to close out with, remind me the number of the song or the name? 433. 433. I surrender all. I surrender.